Today on This League, we have a very special guest. Two-time NCAA champion. Probably on one of the best, most dominant NCAA teams of all time, I would say. Uh, 14-year vet. Responsible for killing the Clippers' title hopes. <laughs> now a skills development coach with the New Orleans Pelicans, Corey Brewer. Thank you for joining us. Welcome to the show. Uh, thanks for having me. Do you remember me? Uh, you look so familiar, and I'm like, <laughs> I, I know. <laughs> Why do I know you? <laughs> so, Marty, I'm going to tell you this story about how me and Corey first met. Okay. I was working for USA Today at the time. And I was just a little baby in the media space. I was just trying to do my thing, just trying to make moves and like be unique and be different. Right. And USA Today is one of those places where it's like you kind of have to try to drive news. But I was not about that. And and Corey was with Covey. They were both in the L.A. offices of USA Today. He was with Robert Covington, another one of my favorite players. And I was doing. I think we were doing an interview, but I, I was doing some push a push up challenge. Is any of this ringing a bell? Yes. (laughs) So, so we do this whole thing and somehow it comes up. (laughs) This is so stupid. So it (laughs) comes up. I tell Corey and Covey, I have hops. (laughs) And these guys, these guys are like, I don't think you can touch that exit sign on the ceiling. And I'm like, yes, I can. I am certain that I can. (laughs) And Corey's like, I don't think that you can. And for whatever reason, me as me that I am, I'm like, well, I'm going to show you that I, I know that you guys can dunk, but I really want to show you my vert. Like, <laughs> so I, t- I asked Corey, I say, can I take a running start? He's okay. like, yeah, sure. At this point, I'm pretty certain he does not think, which is making me more aggressively wanting to touch this exit sign. So I run and I I slap because, you know, I don't know if I'm going to like barely touch it with my fingers or what. I needed to touch it. And I ended up touching it in the middle of the hand. The exit sign falls down. Boom, crash. Oh, no. Hits me in the face. (laughs) I fall. (laughs) No, I do remember that. Because you you smacked it hard. (laughs) (laughs) And it did not go at all the way that I planned. And Corey's PR person was, was a woman. She was pumped that I ended up doing it. Everybody was a little concerned whether I was going to touch it because there was a lot of build up and lead up to this. So I didn't know if you would remember that, but how crazy when you, when this happened, Corey, were you thinking to yourself like, what the fuck am I is happening? No, I was like, she really just broke the exercise. (laughs) (laughs) That was the thing. You got it though. You touched it. (laughs) Like, I think now back to it and it's like this five foot five journalist is really trying to show her hops to me. Like, the hops. <laughs> it's, it's ball is life, man. It's, <laughs> I honestly don't know, even know why I did it. I just I don't even know why I was trying to flex like that. It was just the all time Trista move. I mean, it sounds like you had the hops, though. I did have the hops. Yeah. You want to show your athletic ability. Had to. Had to show I was also an athlete. Like I said before, you were on one of the most dominant NCAA teams in at least my memory, right? You would you would say that that's that back to back. I went to Oregon, so that was a that elite eight hurt. Oh yeah, that, we, we had to take Oregon out along had, the way. Yeah, to take us out <laughs> along the way. Um, I think you guys had upwards of ten pro players on that roster. Oh man. We had uh, at least six for sure. And then some international pros. Yeah, we had some guys to play overseas. Yeah. But we had a lot, a lot of guys to play pro basketball. Actually. That's wild. Six NBA guys, four international players. Um, it was one and done super popular then too. But you guys decided to come back and take me through that decision. Um, why you guys decided to do it and how you came to that kind of conclusion um it was a thing that me joakim al and twin green we all came in together so our freshman year we were roommates um and we just instantly became like best friends like all four of us we were always together we did everything together um we were always in the gym playing one-on-one playing two-on-two 
we just loved to play basketball. We also just like we loved each other. Like we had a blast with together. And it was just one of those things, like it was just chemistry instantly. So um, you know, we had David Lee, Matt Walsh, and Anthony Robish in our freshman year. And um, me and Al started, but Joakim and Tor- Joakim really didn't, he didn't even play. And Torian came Wild. off the bench. Yeah, it was crazy. And Torian came off the bench. But the next year, it was like, it was our time. Like, those guys went pro. And it's like, it's our team. Like, we're all roommates. We're together every day. Now we're all four going to start. And then our guy, Lee Humphrey, that was our, that was my man. He's from Tennessee also. I'm from Tennessee. Uh, we have been knowing each other for a long time. We played on the same AAU team. So um, me and Lee was pretty close. So like I was hype. I'm like, yo, this is us. Like this is our five. Like we got a chance. Like and nobody gave us a chance. We were ranked like 75th at the beginning of the year. <laughs> so, but we still believed in ourselves. So <laughs> we started out 17 and 0. We had a little hiccup, but then we we ended up winning the championship. So you know everybody's expecting us to go to the draft for sure. You know after you win a championship, you know our stock was highest like really hot. We were all going to be lottery picks. That's what they were saying. Joe Kim was probably going to be the first pick. Oh, definitely. Number yeah. one pick. Barnani doesn't go number one if we come out. No shot. Joe Kim definitely number one. Um, but it was one of those things where, you know, where you're having so much fun. It's like, you don't want it to end. We really didn't want it to end. Like we were having that much fun. Like it was like, just everything was perfect. Like we, we love the game. We see each other every day. We're winning. Like, we're at the University of Florida. Like, amazing campus. <laughs> Football teams winning. Like, every day is a great day when you wake up. So, um, so after we won it, we all went home to, like, see our families. And we were trying to make a decision. And, you know, me personally, I went home and my dad was like, you don't have to go to the NBA. About the, it's not about the money. It's not about us. Like, we're we're fine. Like my, my parents were older. So my parents were in their sixties at the time. They were like, we're, we've lived our whole life. This is all about your life. It's about what makes you happy. So for me, when I went back to school, I kind of, I was like, I want to stay in school. Like I'm having so much fun. I, don't get me wrong. The NBA, I want to, I want to play in the NBA. It's a dream come true, but you you can only go to college one time. Once you leave college, it's over. Like you can't just go back. Like now I guess guys can test the water back then. It was like, you're either winning or you didn't. Um, so when I got back, I was kind of like leaning, like I wanted to come back. And then I, th- I feel like Al was kind of leaning towards going. <laughs> <laughs> and Joe was more like, you know, if we're, if we're coming back, we're all coming back. If one of us come back, we're all coming back. So after talking, we kind of decided like, man, we're having too much fun. We can only do this one time. Like, like let's do it again. Let's, let's go w- one more time. Let's, let's, let's see if we can win back to back. And we finally made the decision, like, let's do it. We're coming back to school. And it's a great decision. That's dope. How do you think you guys you guys were all roommates? How do you think that changes the on court chemistry? Oh, it definitely it, it helps a lot. When you're with somebody every day, you live with guys. Um me and Al had a bunch of the same classes. Like we were just always together. So you kind of like you really know those guys. You know their tendencies, you know what bothers them, you know, what makes them happy. It's just one of those things. So you just get to really learn their personalities. I feel like that was the biggest thing. We really knew each other's personalities. So when we got on the court, you could kind of, you know how to push your guys' buttons to get them to play harder, to get them to do something extra. Hey, y'all did that big, like, announcement uh, in the arena when you decided to come back, the three of y'all. What was that like? Because you got to you had to have gone into that situation knowing I'm never going to own a room quite like this ever again in my life. So what was the build up to that? I mean, uh, it was amazing. It was so many people there. Like, yeah. that's the big thing. Like the whole old dome was like packed. It was like a, a game against Kentucky or something. It was packed. So everybody was just happy. They were hyped. We just won. We had the trophy there. Like everybody wants to know, like, what what are they gonna do? Yeah. So like you said, we got the whole room, all eyes on us. And you know, we said we were coming back. Everybody just goes crazy. It's like a moment you're never gonna forget. Yeah. And then T Bus swagger jacked you a couple years later. Yeah, it's okay. <laughs> <laughs> it's okay. You know, we did it first. <laughs> just kings on campus. Just like a victory tour, like a float an entire next year to go back to back. Do oh, you for sure. when you watch March Madness now? If it was me, I would be comparing my team 
to every March Madness run that there is, right? Like, I wonder how our team would stack up against this national title team. Do you do that? Oh, for sure. <laughs> like, if you're watching the games, you're like, who's going to win it all? Like, could they, could they beat us? Like, no, there's no way they could beat us. Like, like, just thinking back, just looking at all the teams, like, over the years, I've been doing it for years, like, I always come to the conclusion, like, nah, they can't beat us. You don't <laughs> think since, since 07, any national champion would have beaten you guys? No way. Like, there's some, been some really good teams. Don't get me wrong. Like, even the, the Kentucky team with Anthony Davis was really good. Like, but it's just like, there's no team that could beat us because we had everything. Like, <laughs> we had all five positions. Like, I don't really look at a team that, like, has all five positions. And definitely there's no two bigs, like, two bigs together that was better than our two bigs. That's facts. You believe that, Marty? Do you think that's true? That no team since then? Uh, yeah, I mean, I can't really think of one. This Gonzaga team this year is fucking, they can ball. So, I don't know. They may. I don't know, though, man. They're not built like I wouldn't, that. I wouldn't put, up, put them up against them at all. No They're way. They're not built like that. There's, I mean, it's Gonzaga. It's true. Gonzaga. Yeah, it's true. I mean, enough said about Gonzaga. Like, no shot to the Pacific Northwest where I'm from. But, like, those Florida boys and a bunch of friends that are living together. I mean, you guys were hard rocks. Joe Kim Noah is a fucking hard rock. Oh, for sure. We, nobody's playing harder than us, for sure. Yeah, him swim, doing his swimming thing when he runs. <laughs> <laughs> you said that uh, Georgetown and Jeff, with Jeff Green and Roy Hibbert were Florida's biggest test, right? We were just- yeah, that year, um, they gave us the biggest problem because they slowed the game down. We like to play fast, and we were getting up shots, shooting a lot of threes. Um, they slowed it down and they um, they gave us some trouble and it came down to us making some plays at the end. But um, Jeff was playing great and Roy was that's a big dude. <laughs> yeah, we were just talking about last episode, kind of the death of the rebounder and how guys like Roy Hibbert, you just basically woke up and all of a sudden Roy Hibbert was no longer a like playable, playable, a playable piece. Right. The traditional center has sort of been devalued. Um as somebody who's in the role that you're in now, do you think that there's room for a traditional center in this league with the modern NBA or no? Oh, for sure. It's just um, certain situations, certain teams you can play guys, but a lot of teams are the way they're building their teams. It's all about shooting and spreading the floor and a lot of space. But like if you build your team and you got a big that can really play, um, he's going to play. But I mean, it's not like it's not like the past years. <laughs> like just because you're seven foot, you're not guaranteed to play in the NBA anymore. <laughs> yeah, at one point in time, it was like all you have to do is be born tall. Oh, like, for sure. If you were seven foot, you could rebound. You were definitely going to be in the NBA. I still I, can. I still contend. If I was seven feet tall, I could have had Spencer Hawes's career. <laughs> hey, Spencer Hawes went bad. Oh, Spencer he could ball. No, 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 no. It's a it's it's a for testament sure. to my belief in myself, not Spencer. Marty also thinks he's an athlete. Oh, for sure. <laughs> <laughs> you you don't see Marty right now, but he also believes that he's an he's oh, an athlete. For sure. Seven foot though, you, you got a chance to do some things. <laughs> <laughs> I feel the same way. If I was seven foot tall, I would have been doing some things. Uh, me too. If I was seven <laughs> foot, I feel like I'm still playing. <laughs> 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 no doubt. You uh you played with a lot of great players, Russ being one in OKC. Did you see what uh he recently said about Stephen A? Oh uh, yeah, I seen um some of the stuff he said, some of the stuff um about how the media portrays you and stuff. So what do you what do you think about that? Um it's true. Some guys get bad reps. Like it can be one thing somebody says in the media and it it follows them around their whole career. And that might not even be anything. That person may not be like that at all. So it is understandable. So, and for a guy like Russ, he really does a lot in the community. Um, he's a great teammate also. I, by, I played with him. So I know personally, one of my favorite teammates, um, he's all about winning. He's going every night he gives it his all. Like you can't not like a guy like that. It goes out there every night and plays his tail off. So sometimes it's a lot of, a lot of unfair criticism. Yeah, he's one of those players who's maybe one of the few that still goes full max 82 games. For sure. Like with, if he can play, he's going to play. With load management, he's going to give you 100% every single possession. What do you think the biggest difference is between how he's been painted and how he actually is with his team? Um, I just feel like sometimes people, they, they think he's selfish or he's not really about the team which is totally opposite of what he is. He's um, 
a great teammate. He's all about the team. He really wants to win. I remember Steven and, Adams said that he and um, Russ would like fight over rebounds sometimes. <laughs> oh, he's going to try to get every rebound. <laughs> there's a balance between happiness and chips. Definitely. It has to be a balance. Um, you know, now with everything going on in the world, it's a lot of different things going on. So guys are doing, doing what they can in the community. And it's really, it's really a good thing. Like they're doing their best. They're doing anything they can do to help. So for you to judge a guy, talk about championships, like everybody wants to win a championship. Guys are not, not trying to win championships. You know, sometimes it happens for guys, sometimes it doesn't. But these guys are doing a lot of special things off the court. So you got to you gotta show them some respect and show them some love for all the things they're doing. Yeah, and it's a team game too. So, like, you can't just put every time that Russ didn't win a chip on Russ. No, of course not. Like, sometimes it's, <laughs> teams have better teams. And, you know, it's a lot of great players that didn't win championships. You were just in the league. You were in the bubble. So, like, what – what led to the Pelicans being that first, uh, that first job that you saw? Um, yeah, for sure. I, I still like, I, I, sorry. I feel like I can still play for sure. I'm sure. Yeah. If it wasn't for COVID, I definitely probably would still be trying to play, but with everything happening with COVID and I just had a baby, I like kind of wanted some stability and not have to worry about like trying to get into protocols or trying to find a job, trying to go here, trying to like, be away from my little, my little guy all the time. So, and I always wanted to coach. And so when this opportunity came up, um, it was hard to turn it down just because it's a great situation with a bunch of young players that are really good. And a bunch of guys I know that I played with freaking half my team. (laughs) Yeah, Yeah, I was, yeah, I was going to ask you all that too. Like, how does it feel like just having so many guys that you played with and against, you know, still playing and you're, you know, on the bench, is that a little weird or like, how, how does that dynamic work? Um, it's, I wouldn't say it's weird because they still treat me like I'm a player. Word, word. <laughs> but um, but they listen to me because they know like like if I say something, I'm not saying just to be talking. Like I'm only gonna say something if I if I know it's right or if I did it before. Like I know I've did it, so I know it can be done. So if I tell you like it needs to be like this, they they listen. So I feel like it's a little easier for me. Yeah, you played on that uh young Laker team with it was Randall, Lonzo, Josh Hart, Jordan Clarkson, Bi. KCP, Kuzma, Larry Nance Jr. <clears throat> Do you think if those guys developed into who they are now, which is obviously like, as, especially for you in your field, you know that each situation develops guys differently, but just hypothetically speaking, how good do you think that Lakers squad is if they all fully bake in the oven in L.A.? Um, I think they would end up being pretty good, being really good, actually. Because, you know, if you get a group and they stay together – And all those guys work extremely hard. I think a lot of times people don't see the work these guys put in. And all those guys, they were putting in a lot of work. Um, So it's just in situations when you have a bunch of young guys, teams want to – team like in the market like L.A., they want to win right away, though. So it's – they're not going to just develop you when they can get a guy like LeBron. So (laughs) are you with what the Lakers did? Like, they had – they did right. They had a lot of good young talent and they turned it into LeBron James and Anthony Davis. So <laughs> the Lakers did a great job as a franchise and these young guys, they kept working their butts off and that's why they're in a good situation there right now. Yeah. I'm, I'm really interested in the, how the offense has changed. I know that you weren't there obviously last year, but you guys are doing a lot of interesting things using the, using Zion the way that you're using him. Lonzo's being used in a different way. Um, obviously like Zion being this primary playmaker. It's interesting because the Warriors are using Draymond like that a little bit too. And you've got Braun that sort of does that too, this whole point forward thing. Uh, do you think that's like a new wave or is this just like, a, it's just, like you said, a situational thing, depending on how the coaches want to use their players. When you have a talent like Zion with you're going to get the ball. You're going to put <laughs> so. I'm not going to say situational, uh, what's going on in the NBA. This is a Zion Williamson thing for us. Like, this guy is really good, and he's really good with the ball in his hands. So <laughs> we're going to give him the ball and let him be Zion Williamson. And that's why we've been really good. And he has a lot of teammates like Lonzo and B.I. They want him to be great. So they're able to, here you go, big fella. We're going we're gonna to help you do what we do, and you do what you do. 
it's interesting because B.I. And, and Lonzo were both stars in their own right when they were doing their thing to be able to defer to, to Zion when Zion's younger and, and want him to be great. That's special. Oh, yeah, definitely special. That's why I think these, um, these guys are going to be, this is going to be a really good future. Here. And you got two superstars. B.I. was all-star last year. Zion's all-star this year. And then you have a guy like Zoe who's really good. He doesn't get enough credit for how good he is. And he's only getting better because he's 23 years old. All these guys are young. <laughs> And they're only going to get better. So they just got to stick together. I got banged on on Twitter because I said I'd rather have Lonzo as my point guard over Ben Simmons. And that was fat. I said that <laughs> people. So I, I give I give Lonzo a lot of credit. <laughs> oh, the way he's shooting the ball. Yeah. I tell you what, I tell you what. Yeah. Hey, can we teach Zion another move other than that spin to the left? And man, they can't stop. Hey, hey, I know, I know. It's so funny to me. Like, whenever I talk about it, I'm like, he kind of does the same thing a lot, and no one seems to be able to do anything about it. Isn't that your job, Corey? Man, it's true. He's like, you look up and you're like, oh, he's not not for 10? Like, what? (laughs) Every night, like, they can't stop it. So just keep doing that move. They literally all go over there, too. You can see them trying to shade left and try to stop. And it's like, you just, he's just too strong. Yeah, he's too strong. Once he gets to where he wants to get to, and it's the touch. He has amazing touch to be so big. Oh, like, yeah. Once he gets on the glass, it just like it just falls in. <laughs> yeah, it's, it's, it's not amazing. like it's not like some of these other guys that hit the ball hard off the backboard and just hope it goes in off the angle, you know? Uh, this is soft. This, this is soft. yeah, soft touch. <laughs> no, it's funny. It's 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 interesting to watch his development. Um, and he's not one of those guys. I'd love to see Zion give the like you're too little. He never does that. He never like just is like, you know, never does any flexing. You know me as somebody who wants to hit the exit sign. Like yeah. if I was if I was him, I would be running the scoreboard up when uh, I remember when you were drafted. Me and Marty were talking about this when we found out that we were going to talk to you about how David Stern said your name. He was like he said it so funny, like Corey Brewer. I think someone shouted it out in the crowd, and then he was like, oh, yeah, Corey Brewer. Yeah. I don't know. It, all, it always stuck with me. I was wondering if you ever heard that. I've never heard it. That's what, when I was like. Go back and watch it. That ain't funny. Like, first of all, I didn't think I was going to Minnesota, so I was shocked when they oh, called really? my name. And I was kind of like, oh, Minnesota. <laughs> <laughs> yes. That's everyone who ever gets drafted to Minnesota. No, I really thought I was going. I thought I was going to pick later. So when I when I went. I was like, oh, okay. Oh, damn. Great. I'm, gonna, it's gonna be great. I'm just happy to be drafted. Like, dream come true. But, hey. And and Noah was, was sitting ready, right next I'm to you, right? He said my name. Did you feel any pressure being that first draft pick after KG left for Boston? Um, see, that's the thing. KG hadn't left for Boston yet right. when I got drafted. Oh, yeah, because <laughs> it, like, it was that in between zone. Yeah, it was like two weeks after, three weeks after I got drafted. So they probably never could use any of my interviews. When I got drafted, because all I talked about was, oh, man, I can't wait to play with KG. I can't wait to get to Minnesota. I used to love KG growing up. I get there, there ain't no KG. So it's like, oh, okay. That's what happened and, when Sexton was drafted, too, because he was like kept talking about LeBron, and then LeBron left two weeks later. Yeah, and the craziest thing for me is we end up making the trade, and we brought in a bunch of young guys. And um, we brought in Al Jefferson, and they gave him a big contract. So it was like, Oh, we're going to go to Al Jefferson. Like, we're going to play. We're going to go into our big man. So that was the craziest adjustment for me that, in the NBA. Was, I go from playing fast, moving all the time, to standing in the corner and throwing it in the post every possession. Ooh, so I'm, <laughs> lucky, I'm lucky I made it as long as I made it. Cause, <laughs> cause that could have been, been the end of me. <laughs> you, uh, I, I've always had relationships with friends where when they have a little bit of beef, I have beef with that person, too. That's like kind of how I am as a friend. I know Joakim has had his uh, his tussles with KG. (laughs) When KG came back to Minnesota and you were on that team, did you give him like an elbow on Joakim's behalf in practice? (laughs) No, I don't think their beef was that serious when he came back at first. (laughs) But definitely, I would take up for my guy if I could. (laughs) It's like, this one's for Noah. Oh, for sure. (laughs) Gotta look out for my guy. No doubt. No doubt. Um, You talked about Zach Levine being one of the most underrated players. uh, And he's now having that breakout season. What do you think was about his game gave you that feeling? 
Um, I had Zach when he was uh, early, when he was a rookie. Yeah. And I used to go back at night and work out, and he would be in there just working on his game. And he always was always working hard. And I could tell, like, this, this kid's going to be really good. And just the last few years, he was getting better and better. And I'm like, oh man, he's getting comfortable. He's he's about to he's gonna have a breakout year. And I just felt like this year with Coach Donovan, my guy, Coach Donovan, going over there, he, he was gonna he was gonna <laughs> go to another level. And hey, he proved me right. What's the difference between college Coach Donovan and pro Coach Donovan? Because you played for both. Yeah, not too much actually. Um, you know, in college, he's a little more intense because you treat guys a little different when they're. You know, when you're in college, it's, it's a little different. But he's always been a player's coach. So that's why I, I kind of knew he would be a really good NBA coach because he was a player's coach. And he always puts his players in position to see. Like, it's not about his system. It's about the guys he has and the way they play. Yeah, a lot of guys, I think a lot of coaches try to keep their system the same regardless of the personalities and the personnel that they have. I think one of the greatest Examples of that is happening right now with Steve Kerr. Like Steve Kerr wants to run things the way he wants to run them. No matter who's there, he's going to do it his way. Uh, I mean, that's just facts. But uh, did he did he call you the drunken dribbler while you were playing for him in OKC like he did when you were in Florida? Nah, (laughs) that's funny. I got the drunken dribbler in college, but it's funny because... (laughs) They say I dribble drunk, but I never lose the ball. So, like, I'm the best drunk driver ever. (laughs) 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 It used to be a running joke joke, because they'd be like, yo, you can't dribble at all, but nobody ever takes it. You never lose it. How is that possible? It's just it's just a little bit sloppy looking. That's all. I say it's just I say I've been clumsy my whole life, so it's just it just looks fun. (laughs) I'm gonna call a little bit of cap on that. I know y'all were balling way too hard to not go into practice hungover sometimes. Ah, oh, man, come on. <laughs> <laughs> I believe that a lot. You know, just put it this way. We had a lot of fun in college. We can't go back and win it again. <laughs> I mean, yeah. And if it's working, just keep, you know, if it's not broke, don't fix it, you know? I, sure. I was mentioning your name to a Clipper fan who's a barista down the corner from me. And we talk about basketball a lot. And I was like, oh, yeah, I'm, I'm talking to Corey Brewer later. And he's like, Corey Brewer, he ruined our one chance. At a title as a Clipper fan, it was the year before the Warriors were really, really good. It was what, 2015, right? I think it was 2015. Yeah, 2015. And the Rockets uh were down. Uh it was it was Clippers were up 3-1 on the Rockets. Oh, yeah. And then Corey Brewer came loose. I think someone else came loose too. Josh Smith. Yep, Josh Smith. <laughs> and Blake Griffin had some like crazy layup. And then all of a sudden, Corey Brewer and Josh Smith like took fire. I think you had 19 points in game six and 10 rebounds, something crazy. Uh, yeah, like 15 what, in the fourth quarter. <laughs> yeah. What, what do you remember about that series with the Clippers? And do you think that that was their one chance that you guys stole? We, um, I remember they were really good and nobody gave us a chance. They thought, you know, they're up 3 1, it was over. And I remember being down 20, and in my mind, I'm like, oh, it's all right, we're down 20. We just got to make a run. And I remember getting a layup, then getting another layup, then making a three. And after that, I was like, oh, it's on. <laughs> I can't miss. <laughs> and then Josh got hot. And it was just a lot of fun. Um, we talked a little bit about Zoe. I would be remiss to not ask about the fact that he is on an expiring a lot of chatter about whether he wants to stay in New Orleans. He just, I think, went on the record yesterday say, I do want to stay. Um, I think he's playing some of his best basketball. I think him being off ball and being a shooter and playing defense versus being the playmaker now that Zion's being the playmaker makes him an even bigger, valuable like asset for the, for the team. Do you think he has played himself into a larger role? Like, Do you, do you see him sticking around after this year? Oh, sure. I, I feel like he's going to stick around because he, he likes his teammates and he likes it here. He loves New Orleans. So, but he wants to be here. So I feel like he'll be here. I think New Orleans is an underrated city. It's a, We talked about it being tough to build a brand in New Orleans because it's a football city. But I love it there from a music and food perspective. It's one of my favorite places in the country. Oh, yeah. Oh, yeah. It's a great city. and But if you're winning... It doesn't matter what mark you in. We just got to win. <laughs> right. Yeah. No, as long as you're really good, you can make a mark. You can make a 
yeah, you can make that for yourself uh, wherever you go. And I, yeah, I love New Orleans too. I went, I went to LSU from there. Great, great place. Go Ducks. Yeah, well, sure. All right. <laughs> both, both you teams have beaten them. Part, but it's, it is a good hey, city. Hey, y'all got us. Y'all got us when you were there. It's fine. <laughs> the John Brady era. Y'all ended the John Brady era, actually, I think. I think that was his last game <laughs> oh, in the man. SEC tournament. <laughs> Corey, Corey, thank you so much for coming on the show. It's been um, a blast. I'm so glad that you remember me and my gigantic hops. Tell your friends that there is a barstool employee with tremendous hops. Like if she was uh, a foot taller, she'd be in the WNBA. Oh, uh, she'd definitely be done. <laughs> <laughs> oh, thanks so much. Do you have anything else, Marty? Are we Gucci? Uh, no, I think we're good. Uh, just uh, wanted to let you know uh, we might be at the game in Brooklyn at some point. So might uh, might oh. come might come say hey. Yeah, we'll come say hi uh, if we do. Yeah, you gotta come say hello. All Absolutely. Right. Don't don't be shady though. If we do, don't be like, oh, I don't remember you. I don't know you. I'm gonna say, come on, let's get the push-ups on. Yeah, get, <laughs> get the push-up challenge on. Thanks so much for coming on. Thanks for listening and watching this league on YouTube. If you like this content, please hit the subscribe button right here. More content will come your way straight to your feed. Thanks for watching.